the PS5 and the Xbox Series are now out. And you know what that means? That means we are now in the ninth generation of gaming consoles, which means the eighth generation is pretty much done. So, let's count down the top 10 best games of the eighth generation of consoles. But that was proven too difficult, so I changed it to the top 15. And it was still very difficult. Now, before we get started, there are probably a few things you're wondering. Like, what constitutes as a game released in the 8th generation? Obviously the PS4 and Xbox One, but what about Nintendo, because, you know, the Switch and the Wii U? Well, any game that came out in between the PS4 and Xbox One's launch and the PS5 and Xbox Series launches. It's considered, to me at least, an 8th generation game. Also, this is my opinion mixed with some objectivity in there. So, you're probably like, oh, DPX, good, another list of yours with Smash at the top. Well, no. To make it a bit less predictable, I'm excluding Smash from this list. But with objectivity, I'm not just looking for popular opinion, although that is a part of it. I'm also trying to find and figure out what games were the most influential and or impactful games of this generation. Whatever the case may be. But it is my opinion, so some games you might expect to be on here aren't here. Anyways, with all that down and out of the way, before we get started, you know what to do. Be sure to like this video, subscribe if you're new, turn on notifications, and leave a comment, and you'll be a loyal subscriber. Number 15, Burger King Foot Lettuce. Maybe not the best game of this year, but the most important? Definitely, and it has to go to Animal Crossing New Horizons. Animal Crossing New Horizons came out at the perfect time, being an escape for so many people at the start of a shitty 2020. But even beyond that, it may possibly be the best Animal Crossing to date. The game looks fantastic, the crafting mechanics, and just the free roam are just awesome. It feels like there is way more to do in New Horizons. There was a lot to do in New Leaf, but New Horizons I think might even pull that one out of the water. It's a game where there's not really an end to it, but you can find stuff to do over and over again. I haven't played the game in a little bit, but I'm sure if I turn it on, I'll be hooked and there's there'll be a lot for me to do. That is what I think won everyone over about Animal Crossing New Horizons. And this November, California voters will decide if they wish to spend billions to help fund the work. Proposition 14. I'm gonna be honest, I hate Blizzard because they've done so many stupid things this generation that I honestly don't even want to support them. That all sucks considering how great a lot of their games are. Such is the case with Overwatch. If there is one thing Overwatch has that it uses very well, it's variety. Overwatch has such a variety of different characters that all play differently, so I'm sure you'll find someone you like. Like, you can kind of classify this as a first-person shooter, but there are characters that don't shoot. There are characters with swords and stuff, and that is really cool. And the game is also very addictive because of that. All this makes it a shame that I refuse to support Blizzard any further because behind all the bad shit they try to pull on you, there are some great games like Overwatch. Okay, call this cheating, but I'm including two games at number 13. The Resident Evil 2 Remake and the Final Fantasy VII Remake. You may be confused by this decision, as despite the fact that they are both fantastic remakes of PS1 classics, they are very different. Like, so different I probably shouldn't be pairing the two, like, as if they're the same, and they're not at all. However, their placement on this list represents something, and that is what a remake should be. These two games might as well be two completely different games from their original PS1 counterparts, sharing the same name, characters, story, 
to a certain extent, but gameplay completely different. Resident Evil 2 is now a third person shooter, Final Fantasy 7 is now a third person action adventure RPG. Once again, these two games show what a video game remake should be, and they are both on the spot for that reason. Again, they are two very different games, so it might not seem right putting them two together on this spot as if they're like the same game or whatever. But for what they showed, I feel like these two games kind of even maybe revolutionized remakes. Any video game remake should strive to be like Final Fantasy 7 or Resident Evil 2, and I'm excited to see what other games get remade in the future in this vein. 19 men attacked our country. The 12 of you will be the first ones to fight back. How do you love your family and leave them to go to war? One game that took off in a huge way this generation, and I'm sure we'll be playing for many years and generations to come, was Rocket League. Rocket League is what happens when you take soccer and cars and mix it together. You play a game of soccer with cars, and that sounds dumb as fuck on paper, but it works. It just works so well. The unique concept makes Rocket League a very addicting game. Not to mention, Rocket League is kind of a game accessible to anyone, but also takes skill. It's a simple game to pick up and play if you're new, but at the same time, it does take some learning, and there are certain strategies if you want to be, like, really good. All of this makes Rocket League a game where there is no excuse for you to not play. Number 11. Your father will die. This generation, I feel, was fucking great for indie games. And you'll see a few of them on this list. Like the number 11 spot, which is Cuphead. Cuphead is what happens when you mix up the gameplay of Mega Man, DuckTales on NES, and Contra, and throw in the early Disney art style, as well as a controller smashing, yet in the end rewarding difficulty. The levels and characters just seem so inspired and the gameplay just feels so smooth. And trust me, you will die a lot. I would even go as far as to say, this game might possibly be the hardest game of this generation. And considering any of the Soulsborne games that came out this generation and Celeste, honorable mention, that is quite a feat. But when you beat a level, you feel great, which is what you should be feeling anyways while playing this game, even if you will die a lot. Win or lose, die or survive, you should have a good time playing this one. I wanted to give to you, in the last part of your notes here, the significance spiritually of the number 10 in the Bible. I've said multiple times what my favorite game of 2020 is so far. That being said, if it's my favorite game of the year so far, it should make this list. That game, of course, is Ghost of Tsushima. Ghost of Tsushima is one hell of a fun game. With a great story, and with so much replay value, as well as side quests that will likely keep you busy with this game and will keep you playing for a while even after you finish the main story. The combat is also very nice and unique too, along with the little standoffs that I think are a splendid touch. Not to mention the ending is very interesting as you actually have a choice to make, but the choice you make you still want to see the other option, so you'll want to play through this game again to see it and it is a game you'd like to play again, trust me. All this makes Ghost of Tsushima a great swan song for the PS4. Persona 5, a fantastic turn-based strategy anime RPG game that seemed to win over even non-turn-based strategy anime RPG gamers. But Persona 5 does not make the list. Persona 5 Royal does. I'll talk about Persona 5 Royal though as one package as it will have you playing for a very long time. You have the, what, 500 hours of Persona 5 like regular, which already comes with great dynamics, 
and character arcs, and then you include the next however many hours, I already forgot, and you will pretty much have to dedicate your fucking life to this game. But hey, for Persona 5 Royal, that ain't a bad thing. It's probably worth it. So I'm going to be giving this flavor 8.5 out of 10 scoops. We are back with more indie games, and one indie game that really did put them on the map, and it's easy to forget that it isn't an, an indie game just because of how big it's gotten, is Shovel Knight. My god, is Shovel Knight such a goddamn joy to play? I mean, the very premise is awesome and interesting enough. You play as a knight who doesn't wield a sword, shield, axe, nothing a knight normally would wield, but rather a shovel. That creates for an interesting and unique gameplay mechanic, like when you bounce, which isn't new, but using it to get across to other parts of this level requires a rewarding amount of precision. Throw that in with the amount of content you have at display here, like the Spectre Torment, Plague of Innocence, King of Cards, and you got one of the best indie games of all time. Very close, but that's not it. Let's go to Gary the Retard. What number between two and four? Seven. Want to know a semi-genre of video games that are either hit or miss? Superhero games. However, our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man has a really good track record, and Spider-Man on PS4 might be the best Marvel game, not even Spider-Man, Marvel game to date. Spider-Man is everything a Spider-Man game should be, and more. It, the web-slinging just feels so great, and the atmosphere of New York City looks fantastic. There would even be times where I just web-sling around New York City for fun, for both the reasons I just listed. The story is almost like a Marvel movie, and if you are a fan of those, you will be invested in this. The performances, the twists, the turns, the boss fights, they all make for an incredible package. Little side note, I enjoyed Miles Morales a lot. That doesn't make the list because I don't consider it this generation, but considering Spider-Man and Miles Morales, I cannot wait to see what they have for Spider-Man 2 down the line. Okay, Mrs. Puff, what's my final score? Six. Woo! Look, I know a lot of people hate Undertale fans because they will kill you if you don't think the game is downright perfect. Someday, there will be a day where people stop talking about how fantastic Undertale is. That being said, that day is not today. Undertale just oozes with charm. Its retro art style isn't anything new, but I think it fits the game's wacky and quirky nature very well. The soundtrack might be one of the best soundtracks in all of gaming, and I think we can all agree with that. What other game has this many remixes of just about every single song in the game? Not to mention, those boss fights are certainly unique. All that makes Undertale a game that, well, of course people love it. Oh, chills. Literal chills. It was number five. Number five killed my brother. Oh my god. How about Super Mario Sunshine. Galaxy. Galaxy 2. What do these 3D Mario games have in common? It's the fact that they are all very experimental with what worlds Mario goes on. Something that seems like the Wii U and 3DS kind of skipped, as I don't dislike 3D World or Land at all, but they were sort of just the run-of-the-mill Mario worlds. But Super Mario Odyssey is experimental in the way Super Mario Sunshine Galaxy and Galaxy 2 are, and then some. Super Mario Odyssey may be the riskiest Mario game ever, as in, like, the risks it takes, and it paid off on all fronts. The game feels hella smooth, and visuals, despite being one of the first games for the Switch, might be one of the best-looking games on the console. Not to mention, 
the capping mechanic, which adds a very cool element to the gameplay. Super Mario Odyssey is a must-have for any Switch owner. I'm sure any Switch owner can agree with me, because you most likely have this game. One fantastic game of the seventh generation of consoles was Red Dead Redemption and, again, fantastic game. And it was about time we got a sequel. It was a long delayed sequel, I remember. And, but Red Dead Redemption 2 is even better than the first one. Now, this is actually a prequel, but it is still really good as the visuals are nice. The gameplay is smooth. The story is investing, and the performances are great. Red Dead Redemption 2 takes the best parts of the first game and makes them even better, making this game better than the first in almost every single way, and the first game was damn near perfect. So that should tell you how fucking good Red Dead Redemption 2 is. You know, it was a tough list. If The Witcher 3, a game that most people would have as number one, is at number three. Number three. And I'm saying it's a tough list if the game was at number three. The Witcher 3 blows the first two rather obscure Witcher games out of the water. You follow a stoic anti-hero named Geralt, and proves himself to take on many huge tasks. The game is also very detailed, as you can even see Geralt's beard growing. Like, that's just an example of detail I don't recall seeing in any other game. Huge props. CD Projekt Red for pulling that off. The combat is nice, the visuals are stunning, not to mention the many expansions, and you have a must play. Cyberpunk, please be good. What kind of pencil do we take again? Number two. Take a number two. <laughs> Looks like you took a big number two. If you launch a new console and one of your launch titles is this high on the list and has many people claiming it to be one of the best games of all time, you know you're doing something right. I'm of course talking about The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild is an open world game, and the thought of an open world Zelda game is just plain fascinating. See something in the distance? You see that thing? What about that thing? Or that? You can go to it. Not to mention, the sort of cel-shaded visuals are something I didn't know I wanted, but it looks great. Throw that in with the boss fights and you have a game that some people are even saying is better than Ocarina of Time. And remember, Ocarina of Time is commonly regarded as the best game of all time. So take that for what you will. Now obviously if you're watching my list, I don't quite agree because there is one game better. But before we get to that one, here are some honorable mentions and despite being a top 15, there are still honorable mentions. Look guys, I just can't get over it. You take a video game character whose defining trait is going off the rails, you know, just a little bit, and you turn him into a more sympathetic and human character. You may have noticed, God of War has previously topped many lists of mine, 
but that's for a good reason. Just about everything this game went for and tried to do worked tremendously. Kratos is now a father, which that alone makes him more human as he tries to explain to his son what to do. When Atreus gets mad or upset, you really do feel for him, and it adds an extra layer because while Kratos is trying to teach his son to control his anger, Kratos, his past, he raged a lot, so he is also trying to control that too. I must also add combat system, the linear style, the soundtrack, and the performances are all aspects that make God of War an absolute must-own for the PS4, and that's why it comes in at number one for the best game of the generation. Now is this list. Pretty uh, big list. I feel like, you know, there were too many games I excluded if it was just going to be a top 10. So, I made it into a top 15, but there are still a lot of games I excluded. So, let me know your top 5, 10, 15, 20 favorite games of the generation. And yeah, anyways, if you like this video, come subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.